first, you know, you have all these jurors who will show up to court early in the morning. They are people who have, you know, been kind of randomly selected. They've received this notice in the mail. Uh, then they go to court and everyone is, you know, brought before Judge Marshawn. And the first thing that he'll do is, is read the case caption, read the charges against the defendant, and then he'll provide a brief summary of the case. I, this really stuck out to me when I was reading that all of this kind of information that we know about how the process will work came out in a letter that Justice Mershon uh, just sent to counsel uh, for Trump and, and for the prosecution. And in that letter, he included the case summary that he intends to read to the jurors whenever they show up on Monday. I'm Catherine Pompilio, associate editor of Lawfare, and this is the Lawfare Podcast. April 15th, 2024. Today marks the start of the first criminal trial of former President Donald Trump in New York City. Trump is facing 34 felony counts for his alleged falsification of business records related to hush money payments to Stormy Daniels and others after the 2016 election. After months of pretrial hearings, motions to dismiss and for an adjournment, motions for recusal, and more, jury selection in the case begins today. In light of today's events, I sat down with Lawfare Legal Fellow and Courts Correspondent Anna Bauer, Lawfare Managing Editor Tyler McBrien, and Lawfare Senior Editor Roger Parloff, who will be covering the trial at length. We discussed the case's background, Trump's various attempts to delay the proceedings, how jury selection will work, our plans for covering the trial, and more. It's the Lawfare Podcast, April 15th. Everything you need to know heading into the Trump trial in New York. There are a lot of cases against Trump and specifically a lot in New York City. Um, We're here because one of those trials is set to begin on Monday or for listeners, that's today. Roger, could you just give us an overview of what this case is about? How did we get here? Sure. This one uh, alleges that Trump... Uh, falsified business records to conceal an agreement to unlawfully influence the 2016 election. That's basically it in a nutshell. The facts begin in very shortly in August 2015, very shortly after he announced that he was going to be a candidate for 2016. And allegedly at the Trump Tower, Trump and uh, Michael Cohen Michael Cohen was his uh, private lawyer and fixer. And um, uh, David Pecker, who was the head of the parent company of National Enquirer, allegedly met and they agreed that uh, they would uh, have sort of a pact to prevent negative stories from coming out, from seeing the light of day, negative stories about Trump. And Pecker and Cohen would sort of act as Trump's eyes and ears to look out for these negative stories, and they would try to pay people off in various ways to squelch them. And um, the first of those uh, that the jury will hear about was a $30,000 payment in late 2015 to a former doorman. And then in 2016, there's uh, uh, an alleged payment to Karen McDougal, who was Uh, who says that uh, she had uh, sort of an extended affair with Trump over a period, and um, Trump denies that. Uh, She was paid about uh, allegedly $150,000. And then the last one was the payment in October 2016, just, you know, weeks before the election, uh, $130,000 payment to Stormy Daniels, who had had a, 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 who alleges a sexual encounter uh, with Trump uh, going back, I think it was 2006. So the only one that's within the statute of limitations period is the last one, the Stormy Daniels payment. And uh, so that's the one that the jury will hear most about, but they're, they're, they're supposed to hear about the whole scheme. So uh, Cohen pays that off and then Trump reimburses him over twenty uh, a period in 2017. And the reimbursements come in monthly payments that are allegedly disguised as payments of a legal retainer. So uh, originally it would be paid off in 12 payments. As it happened, it was paid off 
in 11. So you have 11 invoices, 11 checks, 11, and then 12 ledger uh, notations at, at, Trump or, at Trump Organization. So uh, this translates uh, in legal terms into 34 counts of falsification of business records. Falsification of business records is a New York, it's a misdemeanor which can become a, a felony if uh, the falsification is done to commit or conceal another crime. And here the, 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 the falsifications are the mischaracterization of these payments and it's concealing uh, allegedly either a federal uh, campaign finance law violation on the theory that he should have been uh, disclosing these as a campaign contribution and also it's concealing the fact that these are excessive campaign contributions, 130,000. Uh, it's also said to be a uh, violation of state campaign, uh, state election law, and also a violation of state tax law because um, he didn't just pay off 130,000. It was uh, for, it was bundled with some other payments, but uh, a couple of those payments were grossed up. They were doubled so that because he was going to treat them as if they were revenue, Trump had to pay him uh, double so that w when he characterized them as revenue, he would still get fully reimbursed. So those are the crimes. That, that's an E felony uh, in, in New York State, which is the lowest level felony. It's Penal Law 17510 is the statute. And so since he's a first offender and it's nonviolent, he could get uh, probation. Uh, the maximum realistically would be what's called an indeterminate sentence of one and a third to four years. In reality, he would get out after one and a third. Since there's 34 counts, he could theoretically uh, get consecutive, but I, you know that's really rare. So I think uh, that's what we're, that's basically what we're looking at. And just to recap, who are the key players here? Who do we, what are the names we need to know going into this trial? Uh, well, uh, Trump's lead counsel is Todd Blanche, who's also the lead counsel down in the Southern District of Florida. Uh, Blanche is a, a very experienced former federal prosecutor. Then there's a very experienced defense lawyer on their team, Susan Necklace, and she's experienced in both state and federal courts. And then also a guy named Emil Bove, who's also working on the Southern District of Florida case, who's a very experienced federal prosecutor. Those are probably the lead guys for Trump people. And, uh, and then for the prosecution, you know, Alvin Bragg is the DA. There's a lot of people that whose names have come up it it seems like Matt Colangelo is is acting as uh, sort of the main face of this so far. I don't know if that will continue. The most um, senior people are Susan Hoffinger, who's an executive assistant DA and head of the investigations unit, and Chris Conroy, who's been there for 27 years. And there's some other people who are veterans of... Uh, the prosecution last year against uh, the Trump organization for state tax crimes and and also falsification of business records, uh, 17 count conviction of Trump organization and another Trump entity. So uh, those are the key prosecution figures. The key prosecution witness is, is probably Michael Cohen. I haven't seen a, a witness list, so uh, and I, I don't think one is yet been publicized, but just uh, this seems to be what's what we're looking at. Michael Cohen, key witness, probably Stormy Daniels. I think David Pecker, uh, his company had entered a uh, non-prosecution agreement some time back. I believe Karen McDougal, although the judge said that her testimony would be limited somewhat, they don't want to get into a lot of uh, scurrilous, salacious, uh, inflammatory stuff. Uh, and uh, the gov uh, the state would like to introduce, it, it's going to be allowed to, to tell the jury jurors about that Access Hollywood tape because that came out around 
October 7th. And so it was sort of, it, it, it really was threatening the whole campaign. This is the theory at least. And, and so this made it very, very important to squelch the news or the, that uh, uh, what uh, Stormy Daniels was about to reveal. And um, in that context, they want to introduce evidence about three other incidents involving women. I don't know how the, uh, with Trump, uh, three other alleged sort of harassment incidents and uh, particularly the one involving the People uh, reporter for People magazine, Natasha Stoinoff, who wrote an article uh, in that period. Jessica Leeds, who you might remember was a, a woman who said that he groped her on an airplane. Rachel Crooks, who was a 22-year-old receptionist uh, in 2005 that said she had a, a, a regrettable encounter with him. But I don't, it, the, the judge sort of left it open whether he's going to uh, allow all that in. For the defense, I don't really know that they, they had wanted to bring in an expert on uh, federal election commission law for uh, most of that testimony was barred by Merch Merchan, Judge Merchan, but um, he said that he would permit him to speak on certain topics. I'm not sure if he's still worth it at this point. And uh, then, of course, uh, we don't know if Trump will testify. To wait and see. So before we dive in, Anna, could you briefly just give us an overview of the structure of the New York state court system? It has been wild to learn why the Supreme Court is the lowest court. What is going on in New York state? Yeah, everything is backwards in uh, New York state court, or at least in terms of how things are named. Uh, it's very confusing because in most states, um, and then also at the federal level, the Supreme Court is the highest appellate court. Uh, but here we're in trial court and it's called the New York Supreme Court. And at the same time, the person who is typically called a judge at the trial level is in New York state called justice. So that's why people keep referring to uh, Justice Mershon as a justice as opposed to a judge. Um, it's all very confusing because, again, usually it's the opposite. And that is, you know, you call people the highest level of an appellate court justice. They're sitting at the Supreme Court level, but not so here in New York State Court. Uh, and then it continues to kind of be a little bit confusing because once you go up to the next level of, of the court system in New York, you have after the Supreme Court, then you have the appellate divisions of the Supreme Court, the first department, second department, third department, and, and fourth department. Uh, and that is the intermediate appellate level. And uh, it then gets a little bit more confusing because once you get to the highest level, it is not called the Superior Court. Uh, it is called the Court of Appeals. So the this kind of three levels, it goes Supreme Court, then appellate division of the Supreme Court, and then the New York Court of Appeals is the highest court. Um, so it's all very confusing, but that is the lingo that you need to know as we go into this trial. The Empire State, just making things difficult. So before we look ahead, let's cover what's been going on prior to the start of this trial. Tyler, it was supposed to begin last month on March 25th. What happened there? What's going on? Yeah, so as you said, um, I'll, I'll take listeners back actually even before that to February 15th to a pretrial hearing during which Justice Merchan set what he called a date certain, which was March 25th to be the beginning of jury selection. And at the time, it really did look fairly certain. Merchan seemed determined to proceed in a timely fashion. But then we had um, a bit of uh, late breaking news in the discovery process uh, in early March it came to light that many documents, a, a, a pretty sizable tranche of documents from the Southern District of New York um, were transferred to the DA, who then also transferred the same documents, given their discovery obligations to the defense. Given the volume of documents, the defense moved for uh, a 90-day adjournment, and the prosecution agreed to uh, an adjournment, but set forth a 30-day extension uh, to which the judge 
Justice Merchan agreed. Uh, so that brought us to March 25th, not being the beginning of the trial, but uh, another pretrial hearing to sort out the facts here. What what happened? Um, there were three questions that that Justice Merchan was was trying to address it, at that hearing, which was uh, essentially who was at fault here for this these late documents, whether any prejudice was suffered, and, and if there are any remedies that needed to be issued. Uh, essentially, Justice Merchan found that that the prosecution was, was not at fault, that no prejudice was suffered, in fact, and, and no sanctions or, or measures were necessary, and then set a new trial date, uh, a, an even more certain trial date for April 15th, which is the beginning of jury selection. And we will get to jury selection. But in the meantime, before today, the 15th, jury selection has been set, the discovery issue is resolved. But then after the March 25th hearing on March 26th, Merchan imposes a gag order on Trump. Um, Roger, can you talk a little bit about why he did that and what the parameters of the order were and then how Trump reacted as well? Well, he did it for the same reason that Judge Chutkin uh, entered one in in D.C. It was sort of a a constant, the statements on Truth Social and also uh, in public uh, public in press conferences and so on. Um, And he modeled the order very much off of the one approved by the D.C. Circuit after Judge Chutkin had entered one in D.C. And uh, because of severe, you know, First Amendment issues with doing this during a campaign against a presidential candidate, uh, like the D.C. Circuit, she, and like Judge Chutkin, uh, uh, Justice Merchan, uh, excluded himself uh, and also excluded uh, ADA uh, uh, District Attorney Bragg. But basically, Trump could still uh, criticize them to his heart's content, but he could not go after staff, court staff, the DA staff, and uh, family members. But it left out the, the judge's family and uh, the judge's daughter uh, has been a particular focus of Trump's hire. She she uh, is a high-level official with a, a company I think called Authentic that that works for the for uh, Democratic candidates. It's campaign type consulting. And uh, before the trial started, this uh, she had done work for Kamala Harris and. She continued, and the theory is that he she can somehow benefit from, and it is true that some of the candidates she supports uh, have obviously alluded to this case. And the theory is that somehow she could benefit from things that happen here. And the judge rejects that theory. Uh, th- this has also been the subject of a recusal motion, uh, which has been rejected. So... Uh, these were uh, truth social and other contexts messages that were attacking her and 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 so after his first gag order, uh, which he waited a long time to enter, he really uh, didn't want to get into this for as long as possible. But as we really got to the eve of trial, he entered one, uh, and then then he continued to attack his daughter. So he he did expand the gag order to include his daughter to his her his family and uh and and bragg's family bragg uh, after bragg asked for this expansion bragg bragg himself has been the subject of uh in addition to you know the normal harassment that everyone involved in these things gets uh he had one threat on his life that was sufficiently strong that um, it's being prosecuted as a federal crime out in, I, I can't remember if it's Nevada or Utah, and it's actually that case is sealed, so it's a little hard to find out. But anyway, there have been serious threats, and and that's the context. And uh, he has already appealed the gag order. Uh, there's an appellate process in New York called an Article 78 proceeding it's it's sort of like a mandamus proceeding. It's where you say that the judge has viola- has, has so gone outside uh, his discretion that uh, the, the the appellate court needs to inter- intervene. 
and um, even though we aren't at the appellate stage yet. And so one of he's brought three of those this week uh, to try to uh, postpone the trial. And one of those was about the gag order. Now, now uh, the stay was denied by an individual judge, and then a, a panel will rule on it, I think, Monday. But um, on the other, it's not clear how why a gag order would stall the uh, need to require uh, stopping the rest of the trial. Anna, Roger mentioned a Trump motion for uh, Justice Merchant to recuse himself. I believe that motion is still pending. If you could just talk about it, that motion, what were his arguments um, and has anything happened on that front? Right. Well, as Roger mentioned, uh, subject of particular ire for Trump has been Justice Mershon's daughter. Uh, as Roger explained, she works for this you know, digital communications or consulting company that has had a lot of Democratic clients, including uh, before the case, Kamala Harris. Uh, and he basically, this is the second motion to recuse and, and the basis of it is basically that he's saying, you know, because Justice Mershon's daughter works for this uh, firm that has, you know, Democratic clients, uh, that basically she would, you know, benefit in some way or her employer would through uh, the prosecution of Trump. Um, and that it either creates a conflict of interest that is, you know, disqualifying and that requires his recusal, or that it at least creates the appearance of, of impropriety that means that Justice Mershon should recuse himself. Justice Mershon has not yet ruled on this. It, it is still pending. Uh, I do not expect it to go anywhere. It's a very attenuated argument. You know, they they haven't shown something like, you know, that there actually is a financial interest or something that the um, daughter stands to benefit from. It really is just too uh, attenuated of, a, of an argument to really have any legs. Uh, also, keep in mind that Trump has already sought Justice Mershon's recusal previously. He, but this was back in August. He denied that motion. I really think that this is not going anywhere, but we're still waiting for a decision from Justice Mershon. At the time of this recording, I suspect that by the time people listen to this on Monday as jury selection is getting underway, then then we will have an answer. Incidentally, and Anna might know more about this, but I, I forgot to mention that in an abundance of cost, caution, Justice uh, Merchan, about a year ago, I think he, he went to a judicial body, a t advisory body, and said, is this a problem? And they looked at it and said, no. So th there's that additional uh, reason that he doesn't feel this is a problem. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't know that. Tyler, can you bring us up to speed on another one of Trump's pending motions, his motion to adjourn the trial, one of his many motions to adjourn the trial, but this one is based on pretrial publicity. What are his arguments in this motion? What have the people said in response? And has Justice Merchan made a ruling? Sure. So I think this one falls also in the department of motions we expect to go nowhere, as, as Anna said. This motion was hinted at in, at the March 25th um, pretrial hearing. Toward the end of the hearing, uh, Todd Blanche sought the court's permission or told the court that he would be seeking its permission to file a motion for adjournment based on uh, what they called exceptionally prejudicial pretrial publicity. Once we got the, the motion, I think it was March 25th or 26th, Trump argued essentially that that this publicity, which he, he called substantial, ongoing, and likely to increase, essentially will would inhibit his right uh, to a fair trial in New York City. And he also for, went on to further blame specifically D.A. Bragg and, and key witnesses Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels for what he called strategic leaks. The people filed its opposition about a week later on April 3rd, and the contents of the opposition were no surprise because they had essentially laid them out before at, at the hearing. Their argument is threefold that the publicity is unlikely to abate anytime soon. Justice Merchan himself during one of the hearings made this point pretty clear. He he was he was grilled Blanche a bit on on when he expected it to abate then. He was like, I can't remember the exact time frame, but he, he asked Blanche a bit flippantly 
two weeks, a month, two months. And and I think his point was clear that it's 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 unlikely to abate. Secondly, the people argue that there are other ways to adjust for this, especially during the jury selection process, which we'll likely see play out this week. And then thirdly, and I think most compellingly for a lot of people, is that Trump himself is making the publicity worse. Um, and and they cited uh, many, many instances to that effect. They also, the, the DA in the opposition also noted that this is Trump's, that this was Trump's eighth delay request, something that I think Justice Merchant is well aware of. He in the last two pretrial hearings, there was definitely a note of, of impatience here where um, Merchan is seeming to, to to sour on these repetitive, the repetitive nature of these. He kept asking, you know, what's new here? Tell me what's new. Is there anything new that I haven't already seen in the, in the briefing? Which is all that all that is to say, these are the reasons why it seems unlikely that it'll go anywhere. And another one of those attempts to delay was regarding his uh, Trump's motion to exclude evidence and for a further adjournment of the trial based on presidential immunity. Roger, what did Trump argue in that motion? And we did get a decision from Murchan. So what did he say about it? Well, this was a, a, a sort of a tortured argument um, that was obviously attempting to exploit the fact that the Supreme Court is going to hear argument on April 25th on a on presidential immunity and then probably won't rule for another month or two. And so he wanted to delay. He wanted to interpose a, a, a motion based on presidential immunity and then say, let's not decide this until after the Supreme Court rules. And that would buy him some time. So the theory, you know, we've mentioned that the scheme starts before he's president and the payment is made before he's president, but he reimburses it during his presidency. He had not made a claim that that was protected because it's obviously not an official act to be paying um, money to, well, uh, to be paying off uh, you know, uh, money in this way. But what happened was the government, and, and this was not a surprise to Trump, but the people referenced in a motion in limine that they were going to be bringing in evidence of how they wanted to bring in evidence at trial of how Trump had tried to intimidate Michael Cohen into not cooperating and uh, cajole and, and, and later intimidate. So this involves, while he's president, you know, Twitter uh, tweets, it was Twitter back then, uh, tweets about first uh, extolling Michael Cohen before he started cooperating and then trashing him once he did start cooperating. And then also, I think after the arraignment, well, I, I'm not sure if that's covered here, but uh, he, he brought a lawsuit against Cohen for $500 million. But um, anyway, he, he, he said, well, his use of Twitter while he was president were, he used that for official statements. And so those would be protected by uh, presidential immunity. The problem is that uh, he's not being charged for the tweets. These were being offered as evidence of his consciousness of guilt, the fact that he was trying to dissuade Cohen from cooperating. So it's not, he's not even being charged for something he did as president. So it was a very, very weak argument to begin with. And then uh, what the judge did was didn't even reach the merits because it was just too late. You know, you were. Uh, indicted in, uh, you know, March 30th of last year. Um, and, you know, uh, a week or two before trial, you bring this motion. It's just, uh, there's no excuse. You knew all along, this isn't a surprise that they're going to try to use this evidence about Michael Cohen. And, and so he didn't even reach the merits. It's just, uh, it's untimely. Did he appeal that decision? What's happening in appellate court? I think he mentioned it. He he did one yesterday that involved three different issues uh, that referenced three different issues. And I think immunity was one of them. It's sort of it's hard to tell because all of these things are under seal, uh, which is strange because they involve things that have been highly 
public. But presumably, you know, when they pass up the record, it includes something that's under protective order. And so right now we haven't seen the papers. It did sound like this was among the things referenced from what's, dra you know, drips and drabs have, have come out. The New York State uh, document record keeping system never fails to <laughs> make me angry. So this all brings us to April 15th, and we begin with jury selection. Anna, can you talk a little bit about what this process looks like? What can we expect on Monday in court? Of course. And it's a really important part of the process. I think that people really want this trial to get going on the substance, but uh, we are expected to have probably maybe two weeks of jury selection. But in fact, you know, jury selection is, though it can be long and a little bit boring, it's one of the most important parts of the trial. And so it is important, I think, to understand what the process is. Uh, so here is a little summary of, of what we can expect today in New York Supreme Court. First, you know, you have all these jurors who will show up to court early in the morning. They are people who have, you know, been kind of randomly selected. They've received this notice in the mail. Uh, then they go to court and everyone is, you know, brought before Judge Marchand. And the first thing that he'll do is, is read the case caption, read the charges against the defendant, and then he'll provide a brief summary of the case. I, this really stuck out to me when I was reading that all of this kind of information that we know about how the process will work came out in a letter that Justice Mershon uh, just sent to counsel uh, for Trump and, and for the prosecution. And in that letter, he included the case summary that he intends to read to the jurors whenever they show up on Monday. So, and I think it's interesting. Uh, and so I want to read it because it actually... It, you know, it kind of sets out the theory of this being a case about election interference, as opposed to just being, you know, a uh, falsification of, of business records case uh, without that kind of election interference element. So here is what Justice Mershon will read on Monday. The defendant, Donald Trump, is charged with 34 counts of falsifying business records in the first degree. The allegations are in substance that Donald Trump falsified business records to conceal an agreement with others to unlawfully influence the 2016 presidential election. Specifically, it is alleged that Donald Trump made or caused false business records to hide the true nature of payments made to Michael Cohen by characterizing them as payment for legal services rendered pursuant to a retainer agreement. The people allege that, in fact, the payments were intended to reimburse Michael Cohen for money he paid to Stephanie Clifford, also known as Stormy Daniels, in the weeks before the presidential election to prevent her from publicly revealing details about a past sexual encounter with Donald Trump. Donald Trump has pleaded not guilty and denies the allegations. So that's really the first kind of impression that the jurors will get about the case. It is quite interesting just because it does include, you know, that uh, election interference element, I think that there would have been a way to write this that didn't, uh, you know, include that element in the case summary. Um, so that stuck out to me. After providing this brief summary of the case, though, Justice Murchon will then go over some other preliminary instructions and basics, things like, you know, what takes place during a trial, what an indictment is, the defendant's presumption of innocence, all of those kind of basic legal principles, but then I'll also explain what it means to be a fair and impartial juror. And he'll explain uh, some things about, you know, who is, is and who is not eligible to serve as a juror. Uh, he'll also set out the names of the people who are not only expected to be witnesses in the case, but who are expected to just be named in the case. Uh, so a pretty, you know, broad universe of people. Uh, the reason that he'll make those, uh, you know, identifications is because someone that has, you know, a, f a familial or a, a, a personal relationship with any of those people who are w expected to be witnesses or, or named uh, are people who may be ineligible to serve. So once he's gone through all of those preliminary instructions, he will then tell this, you know, sea of jurors who are before him 
If you uh, feel that, or if there's any reason that you are unable to serve uh, based on what I've just told you about what it means to be impartial and who is eligible to serve, I want you to raise your hand and self-identify if you are ineligible to be a a juror in this case. Uh, The jurors will then raise their hands if they feel that they're ineligible to serve for any reason. And then at that point, in this case, they will be dismissed from jury service. Uh, That is a little bit different from how it works in a usual case. Usually they kind of have to individually go up to the judge and explain, you know, why it is that they're unable to serve. Uh, But Justice Mershon for a variety of reasons, uh, de- determined that that usual process will be too long uh, and too complicated, to uh, logistically complicated because of the Secret Service and you know Trump needing to go up and stand there next to the juror while they're explaining to the judge uh, what exactly it is that uh, the reason is why they are un- unable to serve. For, for those reasons, he's decided to just kind of dispense with that individual interview process and just go ahead and dismiss the self-identifying jurors. So then we proceed to what's called voir dire. It is the process by which the you know jurors are questioned. Uh, in federal court, usually it's only the judge who questions the jurors, but in state court and, and including in New York state court, Uh, The parties themselves, the defense counsel, the prosecution uh, can ask questions of the jurors. The idea is that, you know, you want to try to uh, find jurors or seat jurors who actually can be impartial. So we proceed to this voir dire process. Uh, In this case, there is what's called a jury questionnaire, which I think we're going to talk about in a minute uh, in terms of the substance of it. But it's a list of, I believe it's 42 questions in this case. The jurors will be, you know, given this list of questions. They'll look at it. And then, you know, Justice Mershon will just go down. They'll, they'll kind of be numbered and go, will just go down the line and have the jurors respond to those set questions on the questionnaire. And the whole time the parties will be taking notes, uh, because there might be jurors that they want to question. Uh, themselves and and you know they'll be given a, an allotted amount of time to be able to do follow up once they've made their notes about how the jurors responded to these questionnaire questions uh, and then also they'll be making notes because they're trying to ascertain who they want to try to weed out either through what's called a peremptory challenge uh, or a for, for cause challenge. Those are two different uh, types of ways of kind of objecting to seating a juror on the jury. Um, A peremptory challenge is uh, kind of like, you know, you just get a certain limited amount of those. And it can basically be for any reason other than, you know, a a person's race or, or something like that. But, you know, you just get a very limited amount in which you can just say, I don't want that juror and and then they're out. Uh, but then there's also a four cause challenge uh, that is unlimited. Uh, and it's basically, you know, someone just doesn't meet one of the qualifications for being a juror. So maybe they live outside of Manhattan, something like that, or they are someone who it cannot be impartial and fair. Uh, and so maybe, you know, during the voir dire process, they've said something that they've indicated they could not be fair and impartial in terms of, you know, deciding the case against Donald Trump. And so that might be subject to a for cause challenge. And again, those are unlimited, but the peremptory challenges, you just get a certain amount. And it's based in New York on what, by statute, by uh, what your class of crime is. Uh, and so since this is a class E felony, I think, Roger, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's 10 peremptory challenges. That's is that right? That's my understanding. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so we'll go through this whole process and there will be things that the defense will be looking for for jur- jurors as they go through this. There will be things the prosecution is looking for. Uh, it will go on for several days, if not weeks. And then in the end, we will ultimately get 12 jurors and probably six alternates. 
uh, and then we'll go into opening statements. So I think that's a pretty good overview of the process, but we can go into the weeds a little bit more. Um, and Roger and Tyler, if you have anything to add, then uh, let me know. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on the um, the self-identifying process that you talked about, um, because I think this gets to the question of whether an impartial and fair jury is even possible for someone like Donald Trump. And I think the answer there, according to Justice Merchan, is yes, because it's been done before. Um, and in fact, Justice Merchan himself has presided over a civil trial um, in, in, in 2022, um, the people of New York versus the Trump Organization. And based on that experience, Merchan has decided to immediately dismiss jurors who self-identify. Um, so essentially what had happened in 2022 is Justice Merchan had also suggested that process um, rather than individually interviewing each person who self-identifies, um, foreseeing that it would be very time consuming and and logistically difficult in terms of you know courtroom size and everything, as Anna was saying, the defense objected in that case. So they they proceeded with the the, the normal, you know, uh, voir dire process for, for the self-identification stage. Um, but after, I, I'm not sure how many potential jurors, that it was in fact extremely time time consuming, and for expediency's sake, they they then adopted Merchan's initial initial suggestion. Same thing happened here. The defense, uh, Blanche, objected to this suggestion by Merchan, and and put forth uh, during a February 15th hearing what he called a hybrid approach, but. It wasn't exactly clear what this hybrid approach would entail, and and then I think the, the prosecution, I think rightfully pointed out that uh, this was probably another delay tactic um, to to just lengthen the jury selection process. And Merchan agreed, um, and, and essentially that's how we arrived at this self identifying process. And then I also uh, I also wanted to just pick up on the the ten peremptory challenges because Justice Merchan also mentioned that during the jockeying for the the jury questionnaire questions that would be included, um, there was a lot of talk about, you know, questions that serve as a proxy for party affiliation um, or, or questions of party affiliation. So Merchan reminded both sides of the 10 peremptory challenges. And, and he said, uh, if you intend to strike on party affiliation, those 10 challenges will run out pretty quickly. And what types of jurors are the prosecution and the defense looking for? Anna, you mentioned that there are certain things that they're going to try and look for. What would those be? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think part of this is pretty easy to figure out. You know, there, Tyler mentioned that they're maybe looking for proxies of political affiliation. So when we get into the jury questionnaire details, for example, there's a question about what type of media a juror consumes. And so maybe the prosecution is looking for an MSNBC viewer because that is kind of a proxy for maybe being more uh, liberal or left wing. Um, and then maybe uh, the defense is looking for someone who is more of like a Newsmax or, uh, or maybe who doesn't even watch, who doesn't even consume media. I think that that also is, um, you know, something that the defense is looking for. But we also have a sense maybe of what they are looking for. There's some reporting from the New York Times uh, in terms of what the defense, more precisely, what the type of profile the defense and the prosecution is looking for. Uh, and, and from that reporting, uh, Mr. Trump's lawyers want a jury that includes younger Black men and white working class men, particularly public employees like police officers, firefighters, and sanitation workers. Uh, those who have had bad experience with the legal system will also be prized by the defense, which has cast the case as politically motivated. And so again, you know, it, it, the, that's what the defense is looking for. And then on the other hand, the prosecution uh, says that polls show that voters who haven't graduated from college tend to favor Republicans. So prosecutors can firstly will probably be looking for more educated voters from Democratic neighborhoods fishing for those who, as I said, consume news from sources like MSNBC and who are fond of late night comedians like Stephen Colbert, who hosted a presidential panel with Mr. Biden on March 28th. That is really specific. Um, but uh, so that's the kind of uh, thing that we think the prosecution and the defense is looking for. I actually haven't heard any reporting about a jury consultant in this case, but typically in a really high profile case like this, 
the defense team might hire a jury consultant uh, to maybe do some jury studies or, uh, you know, really figure out what it is that they're looking for and who will be most favorable to them. So I am, I would guess that maybe uh, the defense strategy has been informed by some kind of consultant work, but I'm just not sure precisely what. And Catherine, to your, to your point about, you know, what types of jurors each side is looking for, this question came up again in the February 15th hearing when after going back and forth on specific questions uh, and in each side's quibbles with each of them, Blanche got up and said, you know, there's this 12 page questionnaire, but what we're, what we're both looking for, and he gestured to the, to the prosecution, is whether someone likes President Trump or not. So first the prosecution got up and I think it was, it was Steinglass who took issue with that. And he was like, that's not the question. The question is whether you can put these feelings aside to be fair and impartial. And Merchan himself actually referenced that inter- that interaction uh, in the, the jury selection letter. Although we won't know the names of the jurors, the sides will, both parties will. And uh, so they are, there's a lot of open source material, you know, like political registration, that's open and political contributions, that's open. So, you know, some of this stuff, they, they will know. And uh, it's just a matter of picking your battles because you only have 10 peremptories. So let's dive into this jury questionnaire. What types of questions are, are on there? What do you ask a potential juror in the first criminal trial of a former president? Yeah, so I'm, I'm not going to go through all 42 questions. <laughs> um, there will be plenty of time for that. But um, there's you know, some, some very typical questions, like biographical questions, hobbies, um, organizations or advocacy, advocacy groups you're a part of, as, as Anna and Roger were mentioning, types of media consumption, connection or views on, on, on law enforcement or the, the justice system in general. And also, n- notably, whether a juror has read or listened to books or podcasts by Michael Cohen or Mark Pomerantz, read or listened to any of Trump's books, uh, of which there are quite a few. And this actually led to a funny moment in the February 15th hearing where they the, the question was whether to actually list Trump's books or not. And you know, in, in the hearing, they did read several of them, I think about 10. And the repetitive nature of how to think like a millionaire, how to be a billionaire, how to get rich was just so funny <laughs> because it's just clearly that they were they were just sort of cranked out. But um, putting that aside, there is also an, an interesting question about whether uh, you've they've been a supporter or a member of extremist or white supremacist groups. Notably, uh, like there are only six. So I, it's the QAnon movement, Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, Three Percenters, Boogaloo Boys, and Antifa. Five of those are far right groups, and, and one is a far left group. I think which is interesting. What is not being asked, I think, is also uh, interesting. So not being asked is for whom they voted or will vote, um, political affiliations, campaign contributions. But um, as Roger said, that there, there's open source information that you know that you can find that out. And and as Justice Merchan has pointed out, these answers can be easily gleaned, or will likely be gleaned from from the other answers. I also want to point out one interesting question, and then I'm I'm interested in Roger and Anna if, what what jumped out at you. But Ben Wittes pointed out on on his Substack that. There's an interesting question of, uh, and he thinks quite a a clever question of whether the potential juror has served on a jury before and whether or not there was a verdict. Not what the verdict was, but whether or not there was a verdict. And as Ben points out, Trump would be fine with a hung jury. You know, they they don't need necessarily an acquittal. Um, A hung jury would be fine, fine there. So, you know, whether or not a prospective juror was part of a successful jury team or not, I think is is an interesting and, and, and probably a, a clever question, as Ben pointed out. Yeah. And just to add to that, there in that New York Times reporting on what the defense and prosecution is looking for, I believe that there's additional reporting in there as well that specifically says, you know, while the defense team uh, believes that the case is winnable, they think you know, their best shot basically is to find a a jury that might be uh, willing to, you know, hang as opposed to come to uh, a resolution either of acquittal or of of finding the the person guilty. So yeah, I think that that is precisely what they're looking for with that question, Tyler. I think that's a standard question. It's uh, 
in any criminal case, and actually I think it's often even in civil cases, but but it gives you both the possibility that maybe this is the sort of eccentric himself that hung it, but it also it's somebody that knows that that's an option or that's an available outcome. And uh, so it's it's typically asked. Were there any other questions that kind of popped out to anybody as particularly interesting or unusual? Oh, I guess I would add just one. Um, Anna pointed out the, the question about law enforcement, what the defense is looking for. I think I think perhaps not all law enforcement is created equal here um, because maybe your rank and file police officer may be more likely to support Trump here. But given Trump's attacks on the FBI and other law enforcement agencies, um, there might be, you know, a, a pretty fine distinction here. I agree, Tyler. They're, I think that they're really going to be parsing if they're looking for law enforcement. I think that it'll there are certain things that will really matter in terms of, you know, which agency the person works for, what their kind of educational background is, what their you know, uh, a kind of rank is because I, I think that there is this interesting tension where Trump has been attacking law enforcement over and over again, particularly people who work in federal agencies, um, the FBI, you know, and, and so it is a bit interesting how they're going to, you know, walk the fine line of maybe trying to find a police officer that they think would be sympathetic to Trump or or someone who works in law enforcement, but then also, you know, it could go the other way. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it, it's an interesting thing. And do we know how these questions were chosen? Yeah, I think there was um, some of it was hashed out in in pretrial hearings. So February 15th was was one of the, the hearings in which there was a, you know, a, a back and forth question by question, almost negotiation. Anna and Roger, correct me if I'm wrong. I think the bulk of it, though, was was done outside of court um, in, in correspondence between the two parties, and then the court, you know, took this into consideration and then issued this this, this letter on uh, April eighth or whenever it was. I think you know everybody. They start with a template of you know questions that are asked at every criminal case, and then each has questions they want to put on top of that, and then they look at each other's, and they had eight that they were disagreed about and and hashed that out. Okay, so once trial begins, or it's beginning today, approximately how long is it expected to last? I know there's talk about, and also, is it is it happening every single day um, of the week? What, hap- what about Passover? What's going on with the scheduling? So it, 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 Justice Mershon has specifically said in these instructions that the court will not sit on any day in which, you know, people might be having uh, Passover, like any day that involves uh, observance of Passover, uh, the they, court will not be sitting. And so um, for that reason, he's instructing the jurors that, you know, Passover is not a reason to not serve as a juror in this case, basically. However, we do have a day of rest in the middle of the week. I have no, it's so bizarre, actually. He, Justice Mershon, it decided he's going to sit on Monday, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, which is a bit unusual because often judges will do like a day off on Friday or maybe even a Monday, or they'll at least do like a half day on Friday. Like most of the time, it's either you know, it's one of the days that's closer to the weekend that they decide to have as the court's day off. Uh, But (laughs) Justice Mershon wants to have it in the middle of the week. So it's Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. In terms of the timeline, I think it really just depends. But I, I think the maximum that I expect would be two weeks, maybe three weeks. But I feel like especially because he's implemented this system in which anyone who self identifies is just going to be dismissed outright, you know, that saves a lot of time. And I I just suspect that it's not going to go for, you know, more than two to three weeks. You know, as the trial wraps up or, is, you know, goes on and then wraps up. And as we head into you know, the selection cycle and with everything else happening, the other trials um, or cases that are, because don't forget, we also have criminal cases in Florida and DC. 
just if you could all give me your take, what what is what exactly is at stake here as we head into this trial? Yeah, I think I think one thing that we've spoken about before is there is some polling that suggests that should Trump be convicted of even one felony, that you know a, a not insubstantial amount of support falls off um, ahead of the election, and so we can I think fairly reasonably predict at this point that the that the trial will conclude before the election. And, and so, you know, if there is a, a conviction, um, I think that could have real implications for, for Trump's electoral chances. That being said, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I think not all of these trials are probably equal in the eyes of voters. Um, so I'd be, I'd be curious, you know, which felony would have a, a higher drop off of support or not. Um, or, and then maybe if there's like a, an opposite effect happening where people would supporters would rally around um, the former president in the event of a conviction. Who's to say? Well, uh, this is getting way out of whatever expertise I might have on anything, you know, is getting into political impact. But but, um, I had also seen some surveys saying that certainly this case would have the least impact. And I would even wonder just at a gut level if it could you know, have more, you know, uh, have more of a backfiring effect as well. It's, it's not, you know, it's not like fomenting an insurrection at, with, that leaves between four and seven people dead and injures 140 police officers. This is a weird case. It's an old case. It's a stale case. And it has some uh, overtones, especially with Stormy Daniels of, in which there is a victimhood quality. I mean, it, it, there's an overtone of shakedown. You know, she had an encounter with him in around 2006, and suddenly in October 2016, she wants to go public with it. And uh, so I, I don't know how this will play out in uh, the, the court of public opinion. The, the one thing I... I, I, originally, I, I even thought, you know, maybe Trump would be OK with going to trial because it, it sort of plays into his narrative. But that is clearly false. He is doing everything he can to put it off. So maybe he knows better than me that this is damaging. Um, but uh, I, I just don't know how this one plays out. I think the other two uh, could be devastating because, uh, you know, People are have their heads in the sand about the facts, but um, here I really don't know how it plays out. Yeah, I am with you, Roger. I'm not entirely sure what a conviction would mean in the realm of public opinion. I also think that it depends somewhat on how convincingly the prosecution is going to tell this story as a story of election interference. You know, I think that's one of the issues is that that election interference narrative has not really fully resonated with people yet. But one of the, uh, you know, obstacles they're going to face in kind of communicating that story is that there's no cameras in the courtroom here. So they could deliver an incredibly powerful uh, you know, opening or closing, you could have witnesses who come in and who are incredibly, you know, credible and convincing and all that, but it's not necessarily going to translate the same way on paper. You know, like we're all going to be there writing about it and hopefully we're going to do a good job of, uh, you know, communicating all of the like details in, in the most detailed way possible and in the most, you know, kind of uh, animated way possible. But no matter what we do, there's still just kind of limits to what you can do in terms of writing about something that is, is you know, being in court is kind of a visceral experience in a way. Um, and so it just doesn't quite always hit the same when you are just reading about it in the paper or on Lawfare. Um, as it does when you are sitting there experiencing it and you feel the mood in the room. I, I also want to add um, something that uh, Lawfare Senior Editor Quinta Jurassic wrote in The Atlantic, I think days after 
the indictment came out, which was uh, on April 5th, the headline is called, this is actually quite bad. And I think Quinta rightfully points out, she writes, quote, it would be a mistake to brush it off as unserious. The Manhattan case in its own quirky way underscores how profoundly unsuited Trump is for the office he once held and that he is now again seeking. So I think what, you know, putting aside the strength of the case, the, the behavior that's alleged and described is, is quite damning and, and troubling um, for a, a once and potentially future president. So just to wrap all of this up, what should Lawfare listeners and readers be on the lookout for? How are we going to be covering this trial and where should people go to find our work? Yeah, so I would I would encourage listeners to follow our Twitter closely, keep a close eye on our Trump Trials um, New York page, and um, keep an eye out for written dispatches. Um, we'll have you know live recaps after many of the days, um, especially when the trial actual trial kicks off. Um, we will continue to do our weekly Trump Trials and Tribulations, um, which we'll we'll cover the other cases as well. So don't worry, we're not going to let the other ones um, you know fall behind. And yeah, we will be covering this um, quite closely. So stay tuned. All right. Anna, Roger, Tyler, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I look forward to your coverage. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare podcasts by becoming a Lawfare material supporter through our website, lawfaremedia.org support. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Look out for our other podcasts, including Rational Security, Chatter, Allies, and The Aftermath, our latest Lawfare Presents podcast series on the government's response to January 6th. Check out our written work at lawfaremedia.org. Be sure to keep up with our trial coverage by checking our Trump Trials resource page, tuning into our weekly edition of Trump's Trials and Tribulations, reading our dispatches, and more. The podcast is edited by Jen Patia, and your audio engineer this episode was Kara Schillen of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. And as always, thank you for listening. <laughs>